as you could hear, we are being recorded and I think we're being broadcasted on YouTube as well. Um, and while you're typing your things in the chat, uh, I'll be happy to pass on to Lucy for, uh, for a presentation of the EU Citizen Science Platform. Lucy, are you ready or do you need a bit of time for your technical things? Um, no, I am ready, I think. Okay. So, um, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you all for joining. So yes, this workroom is organized, uh, co-organized by EXCITE, uh, the European Network of Science Centers and Science Museums, but also by uh, the EU Citizen Science Project. Um, we already had a really nice introduction of the project by Antonella uh, last week, but uh, today we couldn't uh, not present the, the platform that we uh, built with this project. So this is what I will try to do uh, quite briefly. Um, so EU Citizen Science is a project that has the ambition to become the go-to place for citizen science in Europe, um, a mutual learning space for all citizen science actors and more globally, everyone interested in citizen science. And the main output of the project, it's of course not um, the only activity that we have, but the main output of the project uh, is the creation of the EU Citizen Science Platform uh, that I'm sure you are all familiar with. Um, so this platform was launched uh, in April last year, and we have since had uh, several, uh, release, uh, we have released uh, several new versions uh, with new features each time. And so I just wanted to show you a quick tour uh, of the platform so you can see what uh, you will be able to find in it and what can be of your interest. So I will just be sure to find the right window. I think it's the one. Can you all see my screen? I hope. Yes. Yes. Um, so more than being just a catalog of uh, projects and resources, it's uh, really a platform of where we invite uh, everyone to contribute and to collaborate. Uh, this is why our motto is uh, by the community for the community. Um, so I am going to show you different features that can be of your interest. Um, and as we don't have a lot of time, I will uh, focus on uh, science practitioners that want to get involved, to use the platform to promote their project, but also on their everyday work. So when you land on the platform here, uh, the first thing that I would invite you to do is to create an account. Um, so here, of course, I'm already logged in my account, but uh, this is uh, here you can find a login or subscribe a button and then you just have to fill in the information and the account is not uh, mandatory for most of the features, but this is the way for you to really enjoy the whole potential of the platform. So we really invite you to, uh, to create your account. And another important thing that I want to mention from the start is that the static parts of the platform have been translated in different languages. Uh, so you can choose here the one that you prefer. Uh, as you may have noticed with my accent, I'm French. So um, I would uh, prefer use, to use the platform in France, uh, in French, but for this presentation, I will stick to English. But just so you know, we have a really long list of, of um, languages in which you can uh, use the platform in. And now we can finally go into uh, the important things. Ah, of course, with the Zoom, uh, I cannot uh, see the buttons here. Just one second, I'm sorry. I'm gonna uh, stop being uh, full screen so you will see all my tabs now. <laughs> um, so once you are logging and you are comfortable with the language, you can add your own project to the platform. This is very easy. We have a huge add button here. Uh, so you can add your project, your resources, training, or even your organizations. Uh, I will focus now on the project um, because uh, this is uh, the first thing that you might want to do to get involved. Um, once you have filled in all the informations that are here, uh, your submission will go through a moderation process. We are quite transparent about our moderation process. Uh, you can find in the blog post uh, description of uh, what we are uh, asking for. Um, and once your uh, project will have been through this moderation process, it will, it will appear in the project catalog. Um, and so while you are waiting that your project is uh, accepted, you have many things that you can do on the platform. In the meanwhile, you can uh, browse through our project selection and see all the projects that have been uploaded until now. Um, if you are looking for uh, specific criteria, 
uh, here, if you go in the project session, if you are looking for specific criteria, such as the localization, uh, the topic, or even if the project is something that can be doable at home, this is a feature that we introduced uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, of course, when everybody was in lockdown. Um, and uh, we have at the moment almost 180 projects, and I'm sure we will have way more with yours. Um, and if you want to have more information about the project, you can go on uh, their page where here you have uh, everything that you need to know. You also have some information on how people uh, can participate in the project. You can contact um, the coordinator. Here there is only the main organization. And uh, what can be interested for you, uh, interesting for you is that you can review. So here you can see that this project already has a nice review. And you can also follow projects. So if you think that this project is really uh, interesting and you want to keep it, you just click on the follow uh, button here. And then you will be able to find it in your profile here in follow projects. Here it is. Um, besides projects, we uh, have the same ideas for resources. We have a very nice selection of resources. Uh, you can submit your own uh, with the add button, of course. And you can also uh, use some criteria. And uh, if you find one that you really like, you can uh, add it to your library and you will find it uh, at the same place as this one in resources library. Uh, I would just want to highlight our gold star selection. So this is a selection that has been done by uh, our consortium partners. Um, so we um, organize them in different topics. And so those are really the resources that we find that are the uh, easiest or clearest or the ones that go the more in depth in the, in this topic. So we would um, suggest you to start with those uh, resources if you want to, to start uh, working uh, on those topics. And um, the last important things that I wanted to share with you is uh, the training modules. Uh, we have a nice selection of training modules. Again, it's the same process. You can upload them uh, by clicking on ads. But one thing that we introduced um, in the last uh, release of the platform is uh, actually the MOOCs that we have. So we have a Moodle integration. And if you click here, uh, you will have, okay, I'm already logged in, so I go directly there, but uh, you will have to um, log in, but you can log in with your uh, credentials for the EU Citizen Science website. You don't have to create a new account. And uh, here you can find, at the moment, we have 10 um, MOOCs that have been published um, quite recently at the end of the month of May, if I'm not mistaken, for the most uh, recent ones. And uh, there are uh, courses of, one to two hours uh, on different project, uh, on different topics. So on volunteer engagement, on introduction to citizen science, on the designing for learning. And so I invite you to, to have a look at that. Um, and we will have uh, 10 more project, uh, 10 more MOOCs that will be uh, uploaded uh, on the platform by the end of the year. And uh, for now, I think my time is up. So I will uh, leave the floor to Maria. And if you have any question, you can uh, write to me in the chat or uh, send an email to the stop sharing. Yes. Thanks a lot, Lucy. That was a great uh, quick intro into the UCIT Science Platform. I'm sure there's many more gems that you, that you managed to share in your dedicated seven minutes. So thanks a lot for that. Um, before we dive into the hardcore part of our session today, which is the impact assessment frameworks, I would just like to ask, uh, ask you one question and please type your, chat, your answer in the chat. Um, what comes to mind when you hear impact assessment? What associations, emotions, whatever, in one word, um, when I say impact assessment? Let me know your thoughts in the chat. Challenging, complicated, numbers, important, effective, yes. difficult, indicators. There's yes, something about numbers and, and indicators and a lot of complexity, but important and lots of benefits. 
So our dear speakers, here you see a bit people's thoughts on impact assessment. I hope you managed to try and address their fears in your presentations. Um, first, I would like to invite uh, Barbara Kisinger uh, on screen, uh, who will present uh, their impact assessment framework. Barbara is a senior scientist at the Center for Social Innovation in Vienna, and we're very happy to have you with us. Barbara, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria. Uh, hello, everyone. Yes, as Maria already introduced me, I'm Barbara Kislinger from the Center for Social Innovation. I work here in Vienna and um, I'm doing this presentation on a special um, imp evaluation and impact assessment framework that I developed with some other colleagues, you know, from other institutions, but mostly also with my colleague, Teresa Schaefer. So I also wanted to mention her here because it's really a joint work and actually our publications are also involved with some more colleagues, as you will see. But let's go directly into the... Um, into the uh, topic, let's see. So um, impact is actually evaluation impact assessment as it is currently done in citizen science projects is very often, not only, but I think very often inspired or uh, by the logic model or logical framework. It's, you know, called both ways actually, where, uh, and it's also, and this again is also related to theory of change where you, you start from a challenge or a change that you want to achieve and then you move backwards, so to say, in this logic framework into seeing in order to change this achieve this impact what kind of output outcomes do you want to have and um, what kind of outputs uh, the project directly generates and according to that you would define your activities and already thinking also having in mind already the input that you give there so on the one hand the part of the input and activities is a planned work and the other one are intended results and theoretically you're supposed to i mean if you want to do a proper logic framework model you would already use this as a in the preparatory phase of setting up your projects we know that it doesn't always happen like this and often still you know evaluation or impact assessment comes at the later stage but ideally applying also such a thinking would already require to use such a tool in the uh, very first stage of setting up a project and then we see that there are uh, then different approaches where people also look at focused on different areas so I just took one example here from you know the because it's a very well-known example from the Cornell Lab of, ontology, uh, of Ornithology, who are uh, using you looking, for example, in this evaluation framework specifically on learning outcomes. So, for example, the, they, they say that learning as one of, of the participants is one of their most important aims, and they provide very good and very detailed guidelines on how to assess uh, the learning outcomes of the people. In the other book that I, I mentioned here, The Science of Citizen Science, we actually summarized or made a study of current approaches to evaluation and impact assessment in citizen science, including also the logic framework, including this one on learning outcomes, but including much more. So there we tried to cover uh, the broad spectrum of how evaluation is, and impact assessment is currently approached in citizen science. And we also discuss and present our own framework there. And this is what I would like you to show you here. So it already started some time ago, as I said, with some colleagues uh, when we were also asked by the Austrian ministry uh, to come up with the evaluation um, framework for, for their funding schemes of citizen science. And so um, we said that on the one hand, uh, of course, we will wanted to divide it into more, so to say, a kind of formative evaluation in terms of evaluating the process and the feasibility of a certain project. So as I said, more the classical evaluation of the process itself. And on the other hand, the impact assessment. So looking more at the outcome and the impact of the project. And we divided that again into three dimensions. On the one hand, the scientific aspects uh, of a project uh, and the effects on the, on the, on the science. 
and uh, outcomes of scientific work. Uh, on the other hand, uh, on the participant level, there originally we were mostly thinking about citizen scientists, but actually, you know, we are also counting now in science. So, so we, you know, scientists are also participants, so we would also want to assess the impact on, on scientists, for example. And the third dimension is this wider social impact, or as we call it, socio-ecological and socio-economic impact that could in some cases even uh, include, for example, economic impact, but that really depends on the project. So this is like an overall framework. And for that framework, we also, for each of those aspects, we defined a set of uh, questions and uh, also tried to work on indicators. And um, later on in the breakout, I would also show how we applied this in a very specific project. But going a little bit more into these uh, areas, into these uh, three dimensions, um, to see what, what is possible, for example, what is usually evaluated there, what kind of indicators we, we, we find or what, what our projects evaluating. So in the scientific dimension, the most, it's kind of, so to say, the easiest or the most uh, obvious example is, for example, looking at number of publications. And this is a very wide, uh, widely applied output. I mean, it's from, you know, also the way classical scientific projects are done. Uh, when we look at citizen science, we see here like the, in, in, again, in natural sciences, the highest fields of um, publications uh, uh, that mention citizen science, whereas in, in humanities and in some other areas, it's still a bit lower numbers. Um, but there are also, we find also when looking at projects that look into other aspects or other outcomes of the scientific dimensions, where some, for example, look into this relationship that is established then between the trustful relationship between uh, the members of society and, and, and scientists or the scientific community. So um, mostly people would argue that citizen science um, ideally strengthens also this, uh, this interface, the interface between science and society. And there, might, there are a few examples who are already uh, providing some evidence of how this, how this happened or how this can happen via citizen science projects. Or an enhanced capacity for a joint analysis of scientific findings as some uh, people, some projects would include also uh, the citizens in the actual analytical process of the, of the scientific data. And for example, another one would be on the scientist side, this increased skills in science communication. On the participant side, I already mentioned the, uh, these guidelines on learning outcomes, which are actually um, quite good and quite helpful. And there has been all, there's quite a lot to be found in literature also on how to assess the learning, the direct learning of the, uh, of the participants, although it's often uh, still informal or incidental learning. And uh, yeah, so it depends again how the project, if they have a focus on learning, but some projects then specifically develop also guidelines on how to uh, measure then uh, the, the learning on the side of the participants. But uh, for example, in our project on air quality, which I will go into more detail later on, we have also in seen, for example, um, uh, behavior change or you know, other types of, of aspects that uh, on changes on the participant side. Uh, some of the projects also um, foster more activism, political activism, or more care for the environment, more behavioral change, and, and these kind of, of aspects. And when we go to the third dimension, to the socio-ecological and economic dimension, um, we are trying to look at how far um, working with these individuals in projects, how far that can also have a spillover or cascading to uh, regions or whole communities, to society and in the broader sense, not only to the individuals. And uh, we can see here, for example, of what can you measure there? How, in how individuals might act as promoters in their local communities to drive change 
or to raise political participation and uh, how they also collectively increase their capacity to reorganize and adapt to changes. Um, concrete examples, as I said, from the air quality project is, for example, this higher sense of community, um, situated discussions or stimulating discussions in local communities. So uh, bringing it down really to very concrete, um, concrete problems that they're facing. And uh, we have also seen traces of uh, people then becoming activists and, and influencing on political decisions, for example. So this shift has been recognized also, I mean, uh, by mm, in previous studies also. And, and also, I think nowadays by, by, low, by, by at least European policymakers who also stress this shift very much to uh, engage not only to uh, also rely on data collected by citizens for wider, uh, for example, environmental political decision taking and policy making. And then just a few um, um, few tools or, or methods that we then include uh, or, or apply to, to collect these indicators. And it's, uh, it's not rocket science. <laughs> so it's really as we heard in your comments or I saw in your comments before, it is, uh, it is collecting numbers or collecting also qualitative feedback. So that's what we mostly do. We use uh, you know, the typical instruments used in, in many other scientific projects as well. Surveys, for example, um, interviews in, in all kinds of forms. Uh, narrative interviews also, so for example, um, depending on the context when we work with people with, uh, you know, in difficult social settings or so, they um, also take, for example, photo essays or other kind of re or re research, uh, research um, diary and things like that or some other projects that we have seen uh, implementing such a framework, they use an embedded assessment, uh, assessment uh, where the assessment itself is implemented in a game or in a quiz or something. And it kind of, when it comes to the learning at the participant side, it would increase the skills and knowledge in a playful way. And yeah, finally content it's analysis is what we apply a lot with no. uh, I'm uh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Content analysis, for example, we apply a lot when we do have uh, larger uh, qualitative data sets. So, but this is just to give you an idea that it's not some magic potion that we're using, but it's rather the typical, um, yeah, typical tools that are used in, for example, in social sciences anyways. And this is just a little cliffhanger now. I heard though from Maria that you're not going to be, I cannot choose in which breakout room you're going, but I wanted to go, I will go in the breakout room into more detail uh, on how we applied uh, this uh, evaluation framework and what kind of instruments we were using and how we measured the impact of this very specific project of CAPTER in the breakout session. For, so for those who are coming to the breakout session, then uh, we will go into more detail and see how such a framework is applied in a very concrete setting of an air, air quality measuring project. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Barbara, and for a little pitch as well on your breakout room. Um, there is a question from Sabine, maybe both yourself, Barbara, it's in the chat, and Sabine, you can just take note of it and discuss it in the breakout room. And we move on to the next uh, speaker, uh, who is uh, Antonella Passani. She is the partner and head of research at T6 Ecosystems. And she's representing the action project and the, frame, the impact assessment framework that they've developed there. Antonella, please, the, the floor or the screen is yours. Hi, everybody. Everybody, can you hear me and see the slides? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, so the question, uh, the, the question that was just mentioned is really relevant for the presentation I will give now. Uh, so I will, uh, I will touch upon it in a, in a moment or two. Uh, so um, in this uh, first session, my timing, so I respect 
the timing, um, I will present today about assessment methodology we developed uh, as part of the action project. Um, I coordinated this uh, work and I worked with uh, colleagues at Drift uh, Institute in, in the Netherlands. Uh, and I want to mention and thank them. So Anneli Jensen, Katerina Holscher, and Julia uh, Wittmeyer, uh, and another colleague here at T6 Ecosystem. Um, Action in very few words uh, is a project supporting citizen science uh, and uh, doing citizen science by um, by having open calls. We funded uh, ten uh, citizen science projects uh, and we supported them through an acceleration program made of uh, training and mentoring and networking. But also, uh, they helped us, the Citizen Science Project, uh, we supported, they, they helped us in co-design, co-develop uh, the action toolkit and in understanding and answering the needs of a community that, as you know, is very diverse in terms of uh, models, uh, activities and focuses. All our projects work on, uh, on the pollution topic, but all different kinds of pollution are covered. And we are also running uh, uh, action masterclasses for policymakers uh, in six countries around Europe. And this with the aim of supporting civil servants and policymakers understanding the value added of citizen science for them and also support them in, uh, in developing programs uh, uh, able to uh, to support the community of citizen scientists. Within this program, within this project that is uh, up and running and will end in January uh, next year, we develop uh, this uh, impact assessment uh, um, framework, which is quality and quantitative. And of course, uh, take uh, on board the uh, important uh, work of Barbara and her colleagues. So you will see there is uh, there are a lot of similarities and I mean, we are sort of working in a continuum trying to, to make these impact assessment activities the easiest and the, the most sustainable for different kinds of citizen science projects. We considered five areas of impact, so economic impact, social impact, scientific impact, political impact, and environmental impact, plus a transversal, let's say, uh, topic, which is transformative potential. For us, the transformative potential uh, is the capability of, uh, of a citizen science project to change the status quo in a specific sector. Could be in, um, uh, in science itself, or can be in training, can be uh, in the topic they cover, like fighting air pollution, for example. Uh, and we will see um, what, what we use as a tool for, for uh, uh, mapping this uh, transformative potential too. Here uh, you have uh, a, a snapshot of uh, the subdimension included uh, in our impact assessment, and we will uh, go deeper on that in uh, uh, in the breakout uh, in the breakout session. And actually, you will be playing around with this. Um, what I can tell uh, why so many <laughs> subdimensions uh, and. The, the approach. The approach is very modular. So uh, we uh, the, the idea is that there is no uh, such a citizen science project that can tick all the boxes and can have huge impact on all the dimension and all the sub dimension. This is not the goal of this framework. The goal of this framework is enable citizen science managers or communities doing citizen science to pick up those dimensions that make more sense, that are more relevant for them, and measure. Uh, in a quantitative or describe in a qualitative way the, the impact, the value added, the change, the transformation uh, empowered done by, by a specific project. In order to do this, uh, uh, we uh, work with uh, a an, an, an simple tool that we will see in the breakout session, which is the impact assessment canvas. Basically, it's a four-page uh, document that guides the citizen science project through the, citizens, through the impact assessment process, uh, starting with the logical framework that Barbara just mentioned. So what are the input, the output, the outcome, and the expected impact of, uh, of a project? Um, in, and this enable a, a, 
a self-reflexive uh, uh, moment within the, the project team, but also mapping the stakeholders. So who is going to be affected uh, and how, by, by which specific tool and by, by which specific output of the project. Uh, then in the last part of the impact assessment canvas, uh, a, a citizen science project can really score uh, the relevance of the specific uh, um, areas of impact and dimension and uh, go uh, online and see uh, and find the questionnaires we developed for each of them. So uh, basically can, uh, can do a sort of puzzle uh, selecting uh, the data gathering tools that are more appropriate. Uh, also, there is another document that we just recently developed that is the impact assessment matrix that guide a little bit more in when to do the assessment and uh, who to interview or who to, uh, to talk with in order to have the relevant data. Why this methodology has been done in a quality quantitative uh, way or mixing a methodology? Because uh, to a certain extent, we wanted to be able to, um, to do a longitudinal transversal analysis of all the pilots we are supporting. So uh, we, we, we wanted to have something structured in common to, to be able, like you see in the action website and here in the screenshot to be able to say, okay, overall these 10, but will be more at the end of the project pro uh, pilot reach uh, uh, 36,725 uh, people, uh, organize uh, 21 events, uh, have more than 500 participants, did uh, publication and blah, blah, blah. Um, and this, of course, was, was useful for us. But I think that can be, I mean, this is the feedback we got, can be useful for those organizations that have more than one citizen science project uh, or that do citizen science as a way of doing their, uh, their work, for example, for those associations that work in, uh, um, uh, in um, promoting uh, uh, environmental ability or fighting uh, specific challenges at, uh, at local level, it can be uh, of interest to have the possibility to compare among projects, to see what is successful in specific, in specific terms uh, or in another, and to do the aggregate analysis, especially when you want to talk, for example, for, with policymakers or decision makers and advocate for your uh, this is then the, the matrix we use for the transformative potential um, can be a self-assessment tool or can be used uh, in, uh, during a face-to-face -face or online interview and um, uh, help considering the different aspect of the project uh, and capability of being uh, or iconic or being uh, uh, catalyzing and being able to, to make a difference in a specific, uh, in a specific sector. So I'm here for, uh, for now, and we will go more in deep in, uh, in talking about impact assessment canvas uh, uh, in the breakout room. Thanks a lot, Antonella. Uh, really nice uh, kind of continuation, as you say, of uh, Barbara's uh, work. They are all seem quite related and uh, both applicable. Um, as, as you said, we will get into in more depth into two of those uh, impact assessment frameworks in the breakouts. But before we do that, we have uh, one more impact assessment framework for you coming from the Mix project, which is also a European Commission funded project. And we have uh, Stephen Parkinson or Parky um, presenting it. He's from Earthwatch and he's a grant and innovation coordinator there. Parky, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah, very well. Very good. Um, yes. So uh, I think the continuation between the, the frameworks and projects, you'll probably see that continue as I talk about mix as well. Um, and I'll just start with a, a quick bit of background to the project for those of you who haven't heard of it. But MIX is a, a three-year project which was funded under the, the SWAF School in Horizon 2020. And it has a consortium of six partners who you can see at the bottom of this slide. 
and the project started in January 2019. So it's, it's due to finish in December of this year. And I just wanted to put up this slide with our kind of central objective, which is to measure the impact of citizen science across these five domains, which again will we'll, uh, look familiar from the, the action project as well. Um, and these five domains are indicative of the fact that uh, we consider impact assessment in a broad sense, and we really have an ambition to be as comprehensive as possible. So we're not just looking at the societal or the environment, environmental impacts, but we want to cover as much as possible. So that's the kind of context for, for the mixed impact assessment framework. And today I'm gonna to describe firstly, how we're developing uh, the mixed framework. And secondly, how we're implementing that framework in an interactive platform, because the, the key output of the project will really be the, the tools which will be available on the MIX website. And as I say, you'll see that there's a lot of crossover with the other frameworks that have been presented today. So I'm going to put probably more emphasis on the, on the platform side of things today, because it's maybe something a little different within MIX. Um, but I'll start. With the, with the framework itself. So the, the basis of the MIX framework is a, a systematic review of 77 publications, which kind of represent current practice in, in citizen science impact assessment. And uh, which of course include uh, publications from the, from the framework that Barbara was presenting earlier today. And there have been other sources that have been considered, including sort of reference projects and um, in-depth interviews with project coordinators. Um, and we consider frameworks such as the sustainable development goals, but on the whole, the, the indicators which make up this initial framework reflect the indicators which we found uh, in that literature review and therefore the kind of current state of the art in terms of citizen science impact assessment. And uh, I don't have time to go into all of this in, in detail here, but if you're interested in reading more about the, the process of the literature review, we have this uh, paper led by Uta Venn from uh, IHE Delft about uh, this, this literature review and it's published in Sustainability Science. So you can go and read about it in more detail. So we have this initial framework with around uh, 80 indicators across the five mixed domains. Um, and as I mentioned at the start, when introducing those domains, we have this ambition to be comprehensive. And so this initial framework kind of reflects current practice in citizen science. But one task that we have now is to go beyond current practice um, and sort of carry out targeted literature reviews for impact approaches from other disciplines. Uh, so, for, for example, we just recently kind of reviewed literature around changes in environmental attitudes and knowledge and behavior, considering papers from outside of uh, the citizen science community, um, because there's a lot of external best practice and expertise, which is very, very relevant to citizen science and kind of can be used to strengthen uh, the current approaches um, so that's how we're kind of planning to progress the state of the art as such. And the other thing we're developing is a set of questions, which of course doesn't sound very new or groundbreaking. Um, most forms of impact assessment have this set of questions, but we hope this also kind of represents a progression of the state of the art. Not only are they kind of this, uh, they have this ambition to be comprehensive as a set of questions, but for each question, we define a set of multiple choice answers to minimize the amount of kind of free text when this is implemented in a, in a platform. And we think very carefully about the terminology and the way that questions are worded to make them as easy to understand as possible and as accessible as possible, um, which, yeah, should hopefully increase the accessibility of the framework and make the uh, impact assessment available to projects who don't necessarily have the, the time or capacity to create their own frameworks or to carry out sort of in-depth uh, empirical assessments of, of impact of their project. And we're testing this set of questions um, in a series of interviews and workshops to try and ensure that there is 
easy to answer and as informative as possible. And we think we'll end up with around 200 of these questions. Um, but I, as was mentioned in the action project as well, but that's not to say that every project would answer all 200, but to cover the kind of breadth that's necessary to hopefully be relevant to as many projects as possible. Uh, yes, we think we'll we'll have around 200 of these projects. And I'll, I'll show some examples of these later. And these questions will form the basis of the interface on the mix platform, which is this um, website where projects will be able to assess the impact of their of their citizen science. And I'll show some kind of screenshots of the, the platform shortly as well. Um, but to return again to this kind of top row in terms of the progression of the state of the art, uh, this in-depth information from these targeted literature reviews will also be kind of included as this additional guidance, this sort of complementary approaches, uh, which will also be included in the platform. So the platform kind of guides uh, project managers to, to implement the impact assessment framework themselves. Um, and I, I don't have time to describe the, the process and the framework in detail. So this might sound uh, a little abstract for now, but uh, I'm going to show some mock-ups of the, the platform now and hopefully demonstrate how this will, this will work in practice. So these images are mock-ups of the mixed platform and the platform is still under development. So it won't necessarily look exactly like this, but uh, they should provide a, a clear idea of what we're planning. So this first image is like a, a home page view. Um, and at the top of the page is some kind of basic information about Mix. And on the left, uh, you'd see if you were logged into the platform, the, the projects which you've created. Um, and in the top right, you'd see your kind of profile. And in the bottom half of the page, there'd be this gallery of projects on the Mix website where you'd be able to explore other projects and their impacts. And clicking on one of these projects would take you to a project page like this one. The second image is a, is a project page before any impact assessment has taken place. So it has some basic information about the project in the top half of the page, the, the sort of usual things of the, the start date and uh, project website, project location, project description, those sorts of things. But the impact report in the kind of bottom half of the page is empty because this is representing a, a project who hasn't yet kind of completed any impact assessment. This next image shows a, a mock-up of the, the question interface. So this set of questions, when the project is uh, collecting information and uh, inputting it into the platform, it won't just be a kind of standard survey. The questions will be laid out spatially in a, in a path like this, where each node kind of represents a different question. And in the, the final platform, there'll be more branching than this as well. So for example, there might be a cluster of questions coming off the main path about health or education. And if that's relevant to the project, they'd be able to answer those questions. And if it's not something that the project considers that they cover, then they'd be able to skip those questions. So as again, as I was saying, even if there are 200 questions in total, it's not that every project has to answer every question. And so for example, as you're moving along this path, a question might pop up from the page, such as this question, uh, about the SDGs. And as you can see, there aren't any free text options for these questions, which means that moving through this number of questions is hopefully quick and project coordinators are able to do it without having to consider too much about how they, they type in a, a free text answer. Finally, this image shows the project page again, but this time with the bottom half filled out with some examples of the type of feedback which the project might present. And uh, I'll give some more details on the feedback from the platform in a couple of slides, but hopefully these will give you a, a clearer sense about what the platform might look like and what it might be able to do. So two more examples of the kind of question interface, which demonstrate some of the additional benefits of the platform. And in this first example, uh, the question asks, does the project have a code of ethics? 
And there's a link within the question to a, a template code of ethics down the bottom. And our ambition is that kind of throughout the platform, there will be these pop-ups or these helpful links giving real-time feedback to the project and providing resources and guidance um, to hopefully, yeah, guide them in developing the project if they're interested in that. Another example of this is this question about the knowledge gained by citizen scientists. And again, at the bottom of the question, there's this link which would take the project coordinators to guidance about how to create uh, questionnaires or how to run interviews and focus groups to kind of gather evidence about whether participants have actually gained knowledge by taking part in the project. And this is important because answering the, the questions in the platform will give a good sort of baseline for impact assessment. But ultimately, the, the impacts of each project will be very specific to that project in a way that can't be automated in a platform. So this guidance provides projects an opportunity to sort of complement the assessment of the platform with uh, a detailed empirical assessment of, of certain impacts, which are most important to them. And both of these examples hopefully uh, give a sense of the benefits of using the mixed platform, but I'll reiterate some of the, the key benefits again. So firstly, just by going through the questions, uh, project coordinators will have an opportunity to reflect on the impact that they're already having and to think about the types of impact which they maybe haven't considered their project could have before and also to receive kind of suggestions about what impacts they could have in the future. So the platform provides them with a space just to think about impact, which uh, can be one of the most important parts. As we saw in the, the first example question as well, the platform will also provide resources and templates which the project can use. And in the second example, we also saw then kind of, it would provide guidance on the in-depth data collection uh, on specific impacts, which they can use as a, as a complementary approach to the questions in the platform. And as I've shown before as well, there'll also be this external, this project page, which can be shared externally and which gives a summary of the project as a kind of uh, impact report. And uh, there'll be sort lots of different ways that the project is summarized, but one element of them, which is kind of potentially more novel to mix is this kind of quantified assessment. Um, and it's an element which we'll offer as part of this project report. It won't be of interest to every project. Um, the, the concept of kind of putting a number on impact is uh, potentially a contentious one, but we think it could be very interesting for some projects and uh, a new way to think about impact. Um, so this quantified assessment will be based on a neural network. So we're currently developing and testing uh, an AI algorithm, which will take the the answers to the questions as its input and uh, through this neural network, convert that to this quantified assessment of impact. There are obviously some other kind of potential benefits of the platform if everything comes off in the way we're hoping. Um, so we might be able to provide some aggregated data about the, the impact of several system science projects and sort of guidance on the common, common tools such as theory of change and uh, or running impact workshops. Uh, but this list should give a kind of indication of the, the key outputs which we're hoping to produce. So I think that's everything I was going to say today. Thank you very much for, for listening. The, the Mix platform is still under development, so we're not going to be offering one of these breakout rooms in the, the session later today. But if you're interested in the project or have any questions, do feel free to kind of get in contact with us. We'd be very happy to hear from you. And uh, you can go to our website or follow us on social media for, for updates, including importantly, when the, when the platform is ready for, for everyone to use. Thanks a lot, uh, Parky. Um, I really like the first benefit that you summarized at the end, a space to think about impact. I think that's a, that's a good one. Uh, when do you expect the for the platform to be ready? Well, as I said, More or uh, less. the project is due to finish in December. So we... So we sometime we, before December. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I won't put an exact date on it, but yeah. 
Okay, so if we repeat this work from next year, then you might uh, offer us a, a run to the, the platform. But I hope you, you managed to stay with us uh, until the end and uh, join one of the breakout rooms. And if people um, have any questions, they might meet you there. Um,